Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted and honored to be with you this morning to talk about my research. Um, this is a subject that has occupied me for over 12 years now. Um, I've published articles and two books, as uh, Horiyoshi sounds mentioned, and the research is continuing. Um, and in fact, today I thought I would take you to three places as I recently visited for my research. Many of you live in Japan, um, in the audience today, or know Japan well. So I thought it would be interesting to actually go um, into the, to look at the very recent research. Um, so we will be looking at uh, one museum that was recently renovated and two um, recently opened ones, so um, entirely new ones. Um, just to start, a few words on my motivation for focusing on art museums in Japan. I'm French, as you can hear, um, and I graduated from the École du Louvre in Paris, um, which is a course of art history within the museum itself. So I like being in museums, I feel comfortable in museums, and after dreaming about Japan since I was uh, fairly young, um, when I finally came to Japan for the first time in 2004. Uh, for me, visiting museums was the natural thing to do. Everywhere I travel, I go and visit museums. And I felt they were the perfect gateway into the culture, the perfect portal for me to learn and discover a culture I had dreamt about for so long. Over the course of a handful of trips after um, the original one, I visited wonderful places um, and also revealed in the fact that I was doing more than just looking at artworks on a wall or in a vitrine. I could experience Japanese architecture from different periods. Um, I could uh, get a sense of Japanese interior design, also garden design, because many museums have a garden adjacent to their building, and also more immaterial things. The space often left around objects was something that um, struck me, uh, so that the objects could breathe. The presence in many museums of a room devoid of any art, so that you could take a breath and reflect on what you've seen before entering the next gallery. Also, the way visitors behaved in Japan was different from um, what I had experienced in the West. So this was all very rewarding, but there is no denying that it could also be hard work. Uh, the language barrier was 20 years ago definitely an issue. It was difficult to find relevant and up-to-date information about museums. And when I could find something in English, it was usually through the prism of architecture, because the building was the work of a famous architect, it would be, let's say, in specialized publications on architecture. So it would be all about that. And nothing was said about what was happening inside. Um, and also, when I was in, back in London, where I live, when I was discussing my trips to Japan, even with people in the art world, people would say, oh, what are the museums in Japan? Or even, are there any museums in Japan? It was a complete sort of unknown um, subject. So I decided I should do something about it, and I set out to have a more systematic uh, research project. And um, in the last few years, definitely become kind of a mission for me. Um, so let's take you today right in the heart of the research by discussing three museums I visited recently. Doesn't seem to work, okay. Um, so here we are at the Kyoto City Kyocera Museum of Art. Uh, this museum was founded in 1933 uh, to celebrate Emperor Showa's accession to the throne. So when it was open, it was called the Kyoto and Throne Memorial Museum of Art, and it wanted to be the expression of the modernity of the city. So due to its strong um, and symbolic link with the imperial family, the museum received lots of gifts um, of artworks to, to honor the emperor. And the building uh, was, for the building, they used the most luxurious materials. You have marble from Europe, stained glass, monumental doors, floor tiles in ceramic. The architecture is typical of the era, it's an um, eclectic style, and you know, at the top of the building here you see um, 
a reference to the traditional Japanese architecture, the, this little triangular shape at the top. After the Second World War, the museum was renamed the Kyoto Municipal Museum of Art, and it changed its name recently again. We'll, we'll get back to that. And the collection presents artists from Kyoto or active in Kyoto or that demonstrate a strong link with the city from the 1930s to today. When I visited the museum for the first time a few years ago, um, I found it interesting. But to be honest, it seemed to me that there were more exciting places to visit in Kyoto, which is, of course, a city full of um, museums and cultural venues. Um, and the interest of a visit really depended on the exhibition that would be taking place at the time. And the presentation was a bit dated, um, I have to admit. But I knew that a renovation project was uh, had been decided in the run-up of uh, the 2020 Olympics. And when I was able to return earlier this year, I was very impressed by the changes. The vision for this renovation was led by Aoki Jun, an architect who is now the director of the museum. And that's something to be noted. It's quite an unusual profile for the director of a public institution to be an architect. And I think that also has an impact on the way the museum uh, is being led and uh, is being quite open, actually, and very connected to the life of the of the city. What I found really interesting is that the renovation project has preserved the original building and the design while bringing contemporary elements, expanding the exhibition surface and widening access to the museum. So this is um, a view of the facade from the side. And you see there is this um, plaza um, in, the sh in the shallow uh, opening that has been created so recently. The, you, the museum opened two years ago. And um, you enter from the lower part. And I don't know if that reminds you of something in France, in Paris, but actually Aoki Jun, when he proposed that design, was inspired by the Saint Pompidou in Paris, for which a similar uh, plaza open towards the city was created. So I was saying that the original design of the bu building has been preserved. So, so, so these are two different staircases um, in the building. So you know, profusion of marbles. So on the left, on the photograph on the left, to, completely to the left of um, the photograph, there is a door on the um, second Japanese floor. Uh, that was actually a room reserved for the imperial family uh, when they were coming to see the museum. Today it's a meeting room. And on the right you see again marble um, everywhere imported from Europe, these modernist um, um, lamps, uh, ceiling lamps and the, the ornate uh, ceiling decoration. The renovation also provided new spaces, a restaurant, an auditorium, and new galleries. And this was done without destroying, but adding, and also making some areas of the original building accessible to the public again. So this is a model you can see when you're in the galleries in the museum, and I thought it would be useful to show you that so that uh, you understand uh, what I mean. So you have this ribbon at the, towards the bottom of the, the image that, so that was created um, for the new um, reno the recent renovation. You enter through that. And um, the two courtyards you can see used to be uh, close to the public. They've now been... Uh, uh, renovated and on one of them you have contemporary art on display and what's completely new is the building to the top left of the image it's a new gallery dedicated to exhibitions uh, temporary exhibitions about um, contemporary art in all its forms so it can be art uh, manga fashion design and what's also great is that on the right to the top, you see there is a garden which was always there, but was not accessible to the public for decades. And it, people can now visit. And this is where the two constructions meet at the back. So on the right, you have the original building with these great doors with the um, uh, metal decoration and the new wing uh, to the left. And there is a feeling of openness when you move in the in the museum. One goes from the original part to the new part without any friction. There is no, they are not in competition. They are rather in, in living inspired coexistence, um, which was attained thanks to the sensitivity of the architects involved. And I really appreciated that. 
And this is a view from the same spot, but looking out, you see it's a substantial garden. It was really a shame not be able to see it, nor uh, walk into it uh, before. So it's, uh, it was a great decision to open it to the public again. And on the left, this is the new um, gallery for the special exhibitions. Um, and you can see that there is a lot of natural light and the type of architecture is quite restrained. The, the, Columns are very discreet. They used uh, brick, whose natural color blends in well with the rest of the building. And so, please look at the, this uh, wing to the left. Um, with this photo, we're directly on top of the new wing. Um, here, they used wood and again uh, this um, brick. Uh, so, you're on top of the building from which you can view the museum's garden, the original building and also you're looking towards the famous district of um, Higashiyama the, to the east of the city uh, so it's a mountainous area with lots of temples so you have this beautiful view from the rooftop. Higashiyama is also a place that is associated with a culture that developed um, in the 15th century so this view for the Japanese has um, a lot of meaning. It is therefore a magnificent viewpoint um, and actually there are not that many places in Kyoto where you can see the city from above. Um, so it's something that makes the museum even more attractive, a cherry on the cake if I may say at the end of a visit. Um, and I mentioned that the, the museum has changed its names once more recently. So as you can imagine, a huge budget was required for this renovation. The museum closed for three years. Um, and Kyocera, a company that has its headquarters in, in Kyoto, stepped in and offered half of the budget, in exchange of which they got the right to add their name to the museum. So this is also fairly unusual for a public institution, but this is a museum that is... Um, quite um, flexible in its views and very dynamic. So um, the museum became the Kyoto City Kyocera Museum. So now I would like to leave Tokyo to go to Karuizawa, where I know many of you today have uh, links with. And this is the Musée Ando at Karuizawa. I'm not being French, that's the name of the museum. Um, and uh, the museum opened exactly a year ago. That couldn't be more up to date. I was there last weekend. Um, this is my most recent research and this way I thought I could uh, share with you what I saw and what transpired from it. So this museum focuses on the art of uh, Fujita Tsuguharu, who um, died in 1968 or 67, I think in Paris. And the other museum I will show you in Karuizawa is um, focusing on the art of a contemporary German artist. So they're two different museums. Karuizawa has been a beloved resort for many decades and over the years a number of museums have opened there. These two new developments, um, one focused on the art of a modern Japanese painter active in Paris for a large part of his career and the other on a significant contemporary artist from Germany show that the area continues to be attractive and dynamic, in particular uh, for private collectors turned museum founders. So I spent time with them and interviewed them. The Musée Ando was opened exactly a year ago and it was founded by Mr. and Mrs. Ando, a couple who discovered by chance um, a work by Fujita uh, 20 years ago while they were, they were in Karuizawa walking around and they entered a the gallery. They had never collected art before, never bought a piece of art. And through that particular work, they became art collectors and it changed their life entirely. They learned a lot along the way and decided to open a museum, which was also a steep learning curve, I understand. Um, their wish was for the building to ref get away from the white cube gallery that they've seen so many times and that we've all seen. Um, and they wanted to offer a different ambience. They wanted to um, echo their home in Tokyo, uh, where they lived with the artworks for many years before transferring them to the museum. So each gallery has a different sort of bright, strong color in it. 
and they even uh, included in the last gallery several leather couches like this in order to recreate the atmosphere of a home, encourage people to sit down on the sofas, take time to relax, spend time with the artworks. So that was very, really key for them is, was to recreate um, the ambience of a home. The collection includes works from more or less all periods in Fujita's life, as well as some ceramic pieces and glasswork. Artworks will be rotated about three times a year. Um, over the past 20 years, the Mr. and Mrs. Ando have acquired 200 works by Fujita and counting. They continue. They were actually just buying something at auction when I was there. So they're continuing to acquire pieces and they will go into the museum. Um, along with Fujita's house just outside of Paris, this is the only museum in the world dedicated to um, the life and work of, of the artist. Um, and Mr. and Mrs. Ando had to approach the Fujita Foundation in France in order to develop this project because the artist was uh, died less than 70 years ago. The copyright still belonged to the family or the descendant of the artist. So in everything they do, they have to negotiate with the Fujita Foundation. And this has been challenging at times. They're not exactly free to do what they want when they use the artist's name or reproduce his work. So that was part of the learning curve um, I mentioned earlier. Um, and this is the museum logo, which I thought was quite nice and, nice and uh, makes a reference to the mountains near Karuizawa. And uh, I was there for the first anniversary of the museum. I was asked to give a speech on Sunday and I had the pleasure of seeing Horiuchi-san at the, at the event. The other museum I visited in Karuizawa is this. So it's in German. I don't speak German. I have to apologize for my accent. Um, I, it's Richter Raum. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't say it properly, uh, but it is um, entirely dedicated to Gerhard Richter, the German artist, um, and this opened in July this year, so very, very new. The museum is of a small size and it is the embodiment of the very strong relationship between the museum founders, Mr. and Mrs. Wako, and uh, the artist. Um, so Mr. Wako met Richter in 1993, when he was still a young art dealer. Mr. Wako is an art dealer, he has a, a gallery in Tokyo. Over the years, um, over the last 30 years, their relationship developed, widened. And uh, Mr. Wako told me he has visited Richter at least 50 times in Germany. He has documented their encounters with photographs since day one. Um, and with these photographs, yeah, so he has a huge collection. He has published a book uh, to celebrate their friendship uh, and the, the 25th anniversary of their friendship. Um, and Wakosan remembers every detail of their common history. When you talk to him, he's hugely enthusiastic and he shows you a photograph and says, oh, I saw him in New York. And that was 15 years ago. I saw him in Paris for an exhibition. It's, it's a, a hugely meaningful for him, this, this relationship. Mr. Wako and his wife decided to move to Karuizawa in 2020 for family reasons. In the new home he was designing, building, Wako-san thought he would have a um, collection room where he would uh, display um, some of his works by Richter for his own enjoyment. When he told the artist, Richter said that he wasn't very comfortable with the idea. He said... Uh, I don't like the fact that it's only for you. They, they should, these works should be presented to the public. So Wakosan then changed his mind, started a long conversation, which went on then for, for three years. And um, it resulted in Mr. Wako designing a building himself. The, he's not an architect, but um, he designed something directly inspired by Richter's studio in Germany, just outside Bonn. And it is located in a residential area in Karuiza, where you see it's surrounded by trees. And it's just like um, Richter's studio in Germany. So this is the office, so it's a view of the outside, sorry, for now. Um, so again, it's, it's in a beautiful, um, quiet residential area. It's the view um, from the outside. So talk about um, white cube gallery, we're definitely in... Uh, um, a type of museum like that. It's definitely a white cube. 
And this is the office of Mr. Wako within the museum. And here, every single detail echoes the artist studio in Germany. The window is actually in the place of a painting that is a landscape in Richter's um, room in Germany. Then the placements of the artworks echoes what's happening in the artist's office. The furniture is copied from what is in Richter's office in Germany. Every the, the filing system is the same that he has in Germany. The office is not open to the public, uh, so which is a shame in a way because it, it's quite significant. Um, the way it's designed is, it really tells a story. Wako, Mr. Wako works there during the day. He can't open it to the public all the time, but he was thinking maybe to open it once or twice a month so that he can explain the story to visitors because it, it, has, a, it has meaning. And there are two galleries open to the public. This is one of them. Um, and inside the works illustrate all periods and all styles um, of the artist. They're elegantly presented. As you can see, there are no labels. Nothing distracts your eyes. It's very well lit. Um, and there is a lot of space between each artworks. Mrs. Wako, who is an art curator herself, convinced Mr. Wako not to put too many artworks at one time um, in the museum. Um, so you can really appreciate each one of them um, separately. And uh, the display will be rotated once a year. The works on view are from Mr. and Mrs. Wako's collection, from um, other private collections in Japan, and they have loans from Richter as well. And of course, when they were talking to the artist, um, he encouraged them to put less works than more works on view in, in the rooms. So you see his glass work, his painting, his landscapes, uh, some installation. So the whole project was done really in discussion, collaboration with the artist, but he hasn't been able to come and visit the museum. He's quite elderly now, he can't travel anymore. So that's the only sad part of the story, is that he can't, he can't come in and see it and spend time with Mr. Wako there. And outside there is um, an artwork permanently on view that has been created specifically for this museum. And that's something wako is hugely excited about. Um, when he contacted Mr. Richter to say, I want to open this gallery, he said, I would like to have um, a work outside. And Richter had something in his mind already. So Richter had been thinking about something like that for years, but he had not been able to make it happen uh, due to technical issues. So then they started having a back and forth, um, discussing how they could make it happen to make this work strong enough to, to withstand um, um, being outside for a long period. Um, and they finally made it. So it's a first also for Richter. It's um, the uh, sheets of aluminium onto which the color has been printed directly. And then it's covered in glass. Um, to protect the color and you so i was there on monday it was pouring with rain so you can't really see too well but when you you have blue skies and uh, let's say a white cloud passing by it is reflected on the glass of the the work so it's really beautiful at all season and a huge success both wako -san and richter were very happy with the results and it really came about because the gallery was created and they're both particularly gratified because in one work you have all the different um, types of artworks that Richter has been uh, realizing in his career. You have the, as the mirror aspect with a reflection in the glass, the glass work and the um, stripped painting. So it's a very significant work that is now in Japan. So in talking to Wako-san, I could really feel how passionate he was um, with his relationship with Richter and how his life evolved in measure ways through that story. He met him as a young art dealer. Through that, he became a photographer, a publisher, a collector, and now a museum designer and a museum founder. So it's hugely significant for him. Um, 
he also asks uh, as a, as an aside when you I, I was allowed to take photographs um but normally people are not he uh, tells me he wants people to look at the artworks and not be behind their phone um taking photographs and also because you have a lot of glass work you don't want people to back off into an artwork and damage it so normally you can't take pictures inside as I hope I convey today, the relationship between the artists and uh, the person who founded the museum is an inspiring story. And I was lucky that Wakosan sat down with me to share it with me. But as you can imagine, you cannot possibly do that with every visitor. However, a visit to the museum, um, which is of a limited size, is vastly enhanced uh, when there is an awareness of this personal connection and the meaning of each piece uh, and the reason what, behind each decision in the design, for example. So I hope that through my research and then writings and presentations like today, I can share these stories and um, tell what happens in museums and so also behind the scenes. In the case of the Kyoto Kyocera Museum, to show the dynamism of some of the public museums in Japan. And then in the case of private museums, such as the Musée Ando or the Richter Raum, um, they, these are quite personal and even intimate stories. So I hope in turn to encourage uh, people to go and visit for themselves, as well as to enhance the content of the experience when they make uh, a visit and hopefully make it in turn more rewarding. So this is my stories for today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Firstly, uh, I'd like to ask uh, my question to you uh, as the uh, beginning uh, of the Q&A session. Um, my uh, question is uh, very simple. Mm -hmm. um, so what uh, kind of uh, uh, art museum, uh, if you are, you, if you are to create an art museum by yourself, mm. what kind of uh, art museum uh, do you make? Uh, that is my first question. Mm. So I've never been asked that before. It's quite interesting. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is not actually creating a new museum from scratch. A type of museum that I'm very fond of and um, I think is meaningful are artist houses turned into a museum. So it's a way of preserving a traditional building which or a, a historical building which i'm very keen on too many of them are disappearing especially in japan and then it's like time capsule and you enter the universe of an artist you see his private life as well as his work so i really really love um artist houses and thinking about the asakura sculpture museum in tokyo or kawaii kanjiro and the namikawa Klazen in kyoto so i love this so being able to uh, open a an artist house to the public one day would, you know, I find that lovely. Then um, I think the size of the museum is important, so something not too big and um, a building that has character is key. I think that stays with you when you visit a museum that is different from the others and that's what I'm trying to, when I select the museum, because I, I visited over well, close to 200 museums in, the, in Japan over the course of my research. So they're not absolutely all in the book. Sometimes I find them maybe um, less interesting or, um, they, or maybe sometimes they lack character or they don't have a collection. They're just an empty building that is that comes alive when the collection comes. So, yeah, I think it's important to create a museum through the architecture and the collection that you propose. I think you need to try and do something a little bit different, something that has character so that it, people re remember it. Okay, uh, then uh, in that sense, uh, uh, which uh, Japanese museum do you like uh, most? Ah, well, that's a very difficult question because obviously I've seen so many. Um, it depends, you know, sometimes you have three hours in front of you and you go to the Tokyo National Museum or you know, and, 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 and you can spend that amount of time. Sometimes you just have an hour and you want a quick visit. So it depends on my mood, it depends on the exhibition. Um, in Tokyo, of course, I like the Nezu Museum. I think the 
the, the size, the quality of the collection, the presence of the garden. Uh, it's a little, you know, it's um, ideal, as I mentioned. I love um, artist houses. There is also a number of um, outdoor museums in Japan, which I found very exciting. Uh, you don't necessarily find that many in Europe, um, where they collect um, examples of architectures from different periods. So the Meiji Mura or um, the Sankien Garden in um, Yokohama. There is one also in Hokkaido and one in Shikoku. I love these museums where you they, you walk along and something like looks like a park and you have a collection of um, examples of architecture from different periods. They're real buildings. They've been saved from often from destruction, brought back there, rebuilt and restored. And um, so I love these museums. Um, you travel through time a little bit and you experience um the buildings um, in a very lively way. You know, when it's a minka, when it's a traditional farm, um, all year round you have volunteers in all of these museums lighting a fire to keep the insect at bay and keep um, the level of humidity low in the in the building. So they're, very, they're often quite personal. The people who run them are passionate. So I'm very fond of these um, of these museums. Okay, thank so you. So I Eve. can't, I can't. In other words, I can't give you two museums that are my favorite. There are so many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, answer. Thank mm. you very much. Thank you so much. My name is Takehito. My question is about the um, successful component or partnership between museum and then other sponsors. Um, you introduced about the Kyoto City Kyocera Museum, but what will be the successful component to get a sponsorship from other organization? Individual sponsorship or a partnership with companies? Um, and in addition to the Kyoto Kyocera Museum, do you aware of adding the company's name to the museum in Japan? Thank you. Um, in terms of the name, I can't, at the top of my head, think of another um, example. Otherwise, it's going to be a museum that belongs to a company like the Sagawa Art Museum in outside Kyoto. Then the museum is founded by the company and run by the company. But a sponsor adding its name to the museum, I, I can't think of an example. It's uh, always an individual story. I think the curators, the people who run the museum, need the funding, but then they want to be free to do what they do. Uh, without any imposition from the sponsors. So uh, I believe they have a good balance at the Kyocera Kyoto in Kyoto. Um, there is a room with, I, I didn't show it to you, but within the original building, there is a room that shows the activities of Kyocera. So that explains why the name is part of the museum and what they do. So you have a little bit of promotion, I suppose, of the uh, company that might be an issue for some museums. Um, it wasn't in the case of that museum, which is again quite open in their approach. Um, uh, all the museums I talk to, the public museum, they tell me they need more money from more funding from Bunkacho, but that's not really coming. So they turn to private sponsoring, but so many companies have their own museums. That they, that's actually the answer to your question. I think a lot of not only private individuals, but companies have their own museum. So that's where they spend their, their funds um, they want to. Um, uh, my name's Claire Brown, just recently moved to Tokyo, old friend of Sophie's actually. <laughs> um, but one thing which we've touched on a bit mm amongst ourselves, but I'm very keen to know, having seen your latest research, are you intending to republish and renew the book to include all these new um, sites? I am very keen to. Um, I would love to. Um, so my latest book came out in 2019. So there's been a few changes. Uh, thankfully, not no museum that I know of has closed directly um, because of COVID. But there have been a couple of um, closures uh, in the past four years for a variety of reasons, one being quite dramatic, the Hara Museum in Tokyo. It's a huge loss for all of us in the city. Um, but so I would like to update a few things. And then every time I come, like you see today, there are new museums. So I would like to update it, yes. Um, it's in discussions. Uh, maybe in a year or two, they, they could be 
enough. Um, and um, this afternoon, I'm, I'm going to Kanazawa and I'm going to visit the new craft museum that was moved from Tokyo um, to Kanazawa. So these sort of updates could be really interesting. And then a few new gems like the two I presented today. So yes, I hope so. Hi, I'm Johnny from the Art Foundation in Tokyo. Historically, the problem with uh, architects and museums has been, um, over the years, many architects have built monuments to themselves rather than a building to show and accommodate the art. Mm -hmm. And um, for many years in America, people said the best art museum was the Damon Neal collection in Houston by Renzo Piano mm -hmm. because it was designed and built not as a monument to the architect, but uh, to show the art. Mm -hmm. And now I think in Japan, as you have with your uh, shot here on this wall, um, what uh, Benesse did with Naoshima uh, is maybe one of the best examples in the world where from the very beginning, the art artist is working with the architect. Yeah. And the architect mm -hmm. is accommodating the art and the artist is accommodating the architecture. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think is the best museum in Japan that uh, is made as a functional museum to show the art rather than uh, half as a monument yeah, the to the architect? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a constant uh, struggle for um, the one in Karuizawa, the Richter realm. Uh, they employed the service of an architect and then they were so unhappy with what was coming. He ended up designing the, the museum. He's not a, an architect. Um, yes, it's a constant battle. Um, and I, uh, I agree with you. What they did in, on Naoshima is extraordinary. Naoshima or, or Tishima in this case. Um, Fukutake-san and his advisors, they, they put an architect and an artist together. And I was, he was visionary in many ways. And you know, when you think about the Chichu Museum and the way the Monet series is presented, um, is extraordinary. Everybody walks in that room and, you know, everybody stops talking and you're taken somewhere else. It's only natural light being channeled through um, um, some space in the wall. You're underground, but it's natural light coming through. And it's the best presentation of any uh, money, um, water lilies I've ever seen in the world. Even it's better than what is in the Orangerie in Paris, which was designed with money, but it's now aged. Um, Th that to me is one of the best rooms ever. And it's because Tarao and Donu, that it, it was built for that series very sympathetically for the artworks. And yeah, he was not trying to show off. Um, the Chichu is extraordinary. Um, I agree with you, sometimes the architects are too forceful in trying to do something for themselves. But I also see you know, sort of switching the, the issue a little bit on its head. I see cities or organizations hiring a famous architect to build their museums because, of course, it, you know, it makes it easier to promote it, it attracts visitors. And then, I don't know, three months after the inauguration, you start having poles, chairs, you know, signs everywhere that kill the interior design and the 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 image that was created by the architect. Um, and that's really a shame, you know, having signs for, you know, the entrance is here, don't do this, don't take photographs, you know, on these plastic um, stands everywhere. It's, that really irritates me. Um, and one um, solution to that was founded by, um, by, 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 was found by Taniguchi-san when he designed the Tokyo National Museum well, in the Tokyo National Museum, the gallery of Horiuji treasures, which is absolutely gorgeous, of course. He made little indentations in the floor because he designed also all the furniture and the vitrines for that museum. So everywhere on the floor you have markings and this is where the chair goes, this is where the bench goes, and nothing else can be added. So you have this perfect, pure interior because it was very, very precise. And some say controlling, but somehow, sometimes it's the only way to keep the spirit. So uh, something to keep in mind as well, don't destroy the, the design and the interior style by adding too much 
stuff, which you see a lot, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank My you. name is Hiroko Tsuboy Friedman. Uh, just a quick question. Like, I'm glad that you actually like, mentioned like, the decline of the numbers of museums in Japan, actually, including the Hara Museum of Art, which is a huge loss. Yeah. I do agree. You know, now, like, you know, like peaking probably like 20 years ago, like, you know, there was about 58 if I remember correctly, a hundred, uh, like in you know, a good number of museums mm -hmm. counted by the you know the agency you know for cultural affairs. Now like you know down to forty five closely, like in you know, like in the hundreds. Now the, of course the counting is quite different like, compared to different countries yes. because like, mm -hmm. you know, the you know the museum law here mm -hmm. like is based upon the social education mm -hmm. purpose. So now like, you know, my question is that like, compared to some other countries like now like China's booming with like, mm -hmm. all the museums like, and so like, the other countries like, you know, especially in East Asia too. Um, like, you know, have you seen like any changes like, in the past years in the in, in the function of museums for society in Japan? I think it is not just in Japan. Um, it's been throughout but I, I saw it as well in London. Um, with the hiatus created by COVID and the fact that people couldn't come physically to museums, um, many of them have tried to have a different way of opening to visitors. So they've done a lot of um, digital content, um, which they didn't necessarily used to do. So everybody has made an effort in that which was great, but I think we all agree, or maybe it shows my age, but I prefer to be in person in the museum. So they're now, everybody's excited to receive visitors, uh, but they're continuing to do the online content as well. So that has opened new avenues for more activities. And a number of them in talks or either public conversations or me privately talking to curators. Or, um, they're trying to offer solace. Um, before you would have said it's an experience, a learning, a place for learning or just encountering beauty. But now a lot of museums try to open offer a, a special moment after what we've been through and um, um, in terms of the subject having something maybe a bit more peaf peaceful or bringing joy or appreciation of course a number also have you know, maybe more contemporary have done things about pandemics and uh, so the, the what happened in the world really had an effect on museums thankfully not that many no museums closed in Japan directly because of that I think and you know there are these two new museums that I mentioned, I think it's still quite lively. Um, I wouldn't say that there are less museums than before. Uh, and you don't want too many to open. You want good museums to open. So we don't need 20 a year. The, the, the key is to keep the good ones going. Um, in the term, in, when it's private museum, like the Hara Museum, the question is what happens when the founder passes away? Does it continue or is it so connected to the person who founded it that it has to close? Uh, that's a big question for private museums uh, that don't belong to companies. Although you could argue that the founder, the, when the company founded it, maybe the next generations are not necessarily interested. So I think that's, that's the question. Uh, it means that a lot of museums in Japan are very because they're so private, they can be different. Um, they really tell a, a personal story, and that's exciting. But the drawback is that when that person disappears, you don't know if the museum will stay. One of my favorite uh, museums, actually, I don't know if uh, some of you have been, it's in Chiba, it's called As It Is. Uh, it's a very special place, um, which was opened by, and now I'm blinking on his name, Sab, uh, um, and art dealer who's uh, much appreciated for his taste. Um, and he passed away last year. And that was his gallery. He was deciding on the display every year. It was very much his taste. And he was a little bit of a guru um, in Tokyo circles for his taste. And he passed away last year. The museum is still open, but uh, for how long? Um, I don't know. So 
that's more the question mark. I think the museums are alive and, and well and with lots of visitors. And there are a huge amount of visitors coming to Japan this year, next year, and they're going to museums. Hey, good morning. My name is Kenji uh, Govars. Uh, I bought your book, so thanks very much. I Thank discovered you. a lot of museums thanks to you. Uh, the Miho Museum around Kyoto, you know, many others, uh, Stagawa mm -hmm. and, and many others, and of course, all the Naoshima. So, um, mm -hmm. two quick questions. The first one is, so thanks to your book, actually, I actually discovered the diversity of all these private museums. And, you know, mm -hmm. as you said, just the story behind mm -hmm. the owner, mm -hmm. the, the work of art and everything. Uh, at the same time, you know, I, I go to Ueno, Mm -hmm. the National Museum. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just my own personal opinion, right? It doesn't reflect anything else, yep. but I'm not a big fan of Bueno National mm. Museums. I find them a bit dark. Mm. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, maybe a lot of signs and postage about what we're supposed to do, mm -hmm. not to do, and what other things. Yep. And, you know, you go to other places like the National Gallery in London. Um, they got a beautiful restaurant, by the way, you mm -hmm. know, not one, two. Yeah. Mm. Um, nothing like that, you know, we have in mm -hmm. those national... So my question is around, you know, a, any kind of... a advice on how mm. to kind of revive the national museums yeah right uh, obviously uh, i recognize the the dynamism of all the private ones which is great you mm -hmm. know? so in many yeah. ways that's yeah. probably the reason why they're so vibrant because maybe mm -hmm. there was a bit of a vacuum at the very yeah. top so that was my my main uh, question the second quick question is i i can't no you know, i can't help noticing that so all the foreigners living in japan they all crave about Naoshima or how great mm -hmm. the place is. We've yeah. all been there like three or four times. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you tell them to your Japanese friends, they're like, where is it? <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> is it in Hong yeah. Kong or in Dubai or somewhere? No, no, it's actually yeah. here. Yeah. So yeah. any sense about, you know, how could that be? Um, just yeah, well. be, I, I know, I, I just to answer about Naoshima, uh, I, yeah, I've been many times. Um, it's on, you know, when people come to Japan for the first time, it's always on their list. And you talk to a lot of Japanese people who haven't made the trip. It takes a while to go there. There is a lot to see. You should have at least two nights. So the excuse is often, oh, it's a bit expensive. Um, I don't have the time. It's a bit of a mystery to me. Uh, why not more Japanese people have been? To be fair, it's very, if you want to stay on the island, you need to book ages in advance. It's, you know, it's very successful. So you need to be organized. I, I don't have... A a complete answer to that. Um, maybe because when you know when there is a, an exhibition in Ueno in Kyoto, the Japanese are very happy to queue for hours, so they want to go to museum. They, they are uh, museum goers, but now Shima, maybe it's a bit too far. I don't know. I don't have it's it, it it's puzzled me as well when I meet people who said they've never been uh, um, and who are well traveled. I don't know. Um, the, that's why I want to talk about the Kyoto Kyosela Museum, because I found it's quite dynamic and it's unusual for a public institution. So it's true, the national museums are these big machines. The bureaucracy is such that they don't have a lot of um, leeway. They always complain about budget. They're also responsible for the most important treasures. So I think that responsibility is a way that they 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 don't change their ways, and they feel they have visitors coming anyway, which is true. Um, private museums have more freedom. Um, I I always I go to see the main shows in um, Ueno, but I also always take the time to see the private museums. You, in a way, I think we're lucky to have the choice. I Kyocera is a good. Uh, first example of a public institution being quite dynamic. I'm hoping that it might open the minds to other museums. Um, what I also hear all the time is that the budget for culture is a fraction of what it is in France or even the UK, and they don't, they can't change so much. And great, so that's the situation we're in. But I see what you mean. <laughs> Yes, uh, we have quite a few online questions, so I'm going to actually consolidate a few. <laughs> uh, one is, um, uh, I think we touched upon, you know, uh, the reasons why you uh, picked these three museums, mm -hmm. but can you uh, mention why you focused on these three museums that you presented today once mm -hmm. again? The other is, what, which museums are your favorite is another question that we've had with so many uh, uh, 
online questions. And the other is for a uh, Western visitor or a visitor coming to Japan, what which museums stand out? Um, who which museums are that are non-Western art in, in your uh, view? Yeah, well, the so the majority of museums do not show Western art. Of course, you have Western art in many museums, but the, the bulk will be about Japanese art and, some, and Korean or Chinese as well. Um, so I think, which are your favorite museums? We answered that. The, sele- the choice for today was, didn't, it, I had limited time, 20, 25 minutes. If I give an hour's presentation, often I show different types of museums that you can encounter in, in Japan. Um, today, because you live in Japan, and I'm sure a lot of the people joining us online are familiar with the country. I thought I don't need to do a general presentation. I don't really have time anyway. So I thought I would um, take you into the heart of the research and discuss three museums I, I visited recently. And I thought each one had an interesting story. So that, that was the reasoning behind the choice. And where to go for a first-time visitor to Japan? Well, I think you have to go to the Tokyo National Museum uh, because it's uh, the place where you can see, uh, you can have a very good introduction to Japanese art from the earlier periods to the modern period. The Gallery of Horiuji Treasures is uh, wonderful. It's one of the buildings in the Tokyo National Museum. You have to go there. It's a fantastic collection and a beautiful building. Then I mentioned the Nezu, it's a good classic. Um, and then Naoshima, you can't um, get away from the fact that it's one of the most interesting art destinations in the world. It's close to 30 years old now, I think. They were visionaries. You, you know, it's, Now you have places inspired by that. I come from the south of France and there is something called Chateau Lacoste near Aix-en-Provence now, which is a direct inspiration what has been done in Naoshima. So um, it has inspired people around the world and it's a great experience. Um, so definitely, yeah. Naoshima, and when I say Naoshima, it's a, Naoshima, Teshima and Inujima, three islands, all um, with um, museums created by the Benesse Foundation. And it's when you go there, I think the key is to see the, to see the three islands, not just Naoshima. Well, I think with that point, um, there's another question that says, what are the uniqueness of Japanese museums uh, compared to other uh, museums in, in the world? So I've been asked that question before, and... I'd say they're not unique. There is no uniqueness about Japanese museums. They are museums like everywhere else in the world. What's exciting in Japan is the number of museums and uh, the quality of the museums and the fact that you have this immense choice. If you're into contemporary art, you have lots of contemporary art museums. If you prefer traditional art, if you're interested in architecture, there is a museum for everyone. They're not unique. They're just a lot of them are very good and you have this immense choice that means that in the big cities you have great museums and also you can travel around the country because they're dotted around the countries and they can take you to the countryside and on on all the islands of the archipelago. That's my point, that's what I found fascinating and that's why I want to write about them and promote them. It's not because they're unique, Uh, it's because they're They're good. It's a great museum destination when you're in Japan. Uh, You can visit a a lot of them. Thanks, Sophie. Um, And the next question that we have is uh, in terms of um, uh, from Deguchi-san. What do you think about education for art for children? Um, This person has a seven-year-old daughter and she's never been to museums. Where do you want to expose her first? In, in Japan? Well, the outdoor museums are great. Um, there is the Sculpture Outdoor Museum in Hakone, which is fantastic and which has a, an area specifically for children. So it's artworks designed by a variety of artists and you can enter those artworks, you can play with them. Um, that's really fun. And now, so I don't know if this family is um, Japanese, but 
in some museum, in starting where you have programs for children. This is something uh, we've done for many years in uh, France and in the UK, and it's starting now in Japan, where curators offer special programs at the weekend um, for children, and that's great. It's a very good way to to take them to the museum and help them enjoy the experience. But yeah, Hakone is a great uh, spot. And in the um, craft museum in Tokyo, I remember they were doing visits for children where you could have hands-on sessions, all only in Japanese. And I don't know if they transfer that uh, to the new museum in Kanazawa. I'll find out tomorrow. But that's also um, some of the public institution have special programs and that, that's exciting to be able to touch the objects or see them not inside a vitrine. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, this is a, actually, this is a question from myself, but, um, you know, we talked, touched upon like funding for mm -hmm. Japanese museums, mm -hmm. you know, in your view, you know, seeing so many museums, um, you know, especially there's private museums and public mm -hmm. museums, how, how do you see how you know how do you see things going on because obviously because if the museums is not going to be funded properly they're probably going to not last a long mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. so how, how do you foresee that because we have so many museums yeah. here in japan yeah i think you know in the west you think about a museum as something that is there to stay and we just have to accept the fact that in places like Japan where you have so many private ones they might close they're just a natural cycle um, it's a shame as long as you can still maybe see part of the collection somewhere else it's a cycle of life I, I don't know if it's something to get stuck on too much because it means that you have so many pub, private museums opening it's very dynamic so that's exciting uh, you know again in the west collectors often will give their collection or part of their collection to a public institution here they tend to open their own museum it's a different approach um maybe there could be more networking amongst those private museums to find a way to support each other because they all have the same complaint but i find that they don't necessarily talk together or join forces to help people find them or find information you know one of the things for foreign visitors is a lack of english um well a, uh, some time ago, I participated to a project in Shimane where you had five or six family museums. They all knew each other. They all have the same type of museums, but they, they were not really networking among themselves. And we brought them together and um, created a website in English, Chinese and Japanese, which helps people find information about them. And the sh costs were shared and it made sense. And then when you're there, you can visit all these places together. So maybe a bit more um, joining forces to you know, on subjects like translations, uh, providing information in advance for visitors could be a good way to, to because of course they need ticket sales. So that's, um, that's what a lot of them need. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Sawako. And uh, also, some, do you have a uh, question? As a bit of as a as a board member of Hara Museum, I would like to tell you that the Hara Museum Tokyo is closed now, but uh, Hara Museum Arc in Tochigi Prefecture is still very active, and I it's it's situated in a marvelous place, mm -hmm. yeah, and I do recommend yeah. all of you to yes. come. Thank no, you. I agree. <laughs> no, I agree. I should have said that. Actually, I'll be there on Monday and I'm going to shoot a video where I interview the director at the Hara Museum Arc and it will be, uh, let's say, next month available online. I have a, a, a YouTube channel where I do videos where I interview people in connection with the Japanese art. And so that's my next video. So absolutely, the Hara Museum is very much alive, but outside of Tokyo, they transferred part of the collection and uh, I encourage everybody to go. And um, actually, Asia Society will be doing a trip uh, to uh, Hara Museum Arc in the spring. Okay, so please. So everybody's going, perfect. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, as the uh, uh, closing time is approaching, uh, I would like to conclude uh, today's session. Uh, thank you very much, Sophie. My pleasure. And uh, please give her a big hand.